Bonjour. Welcome to the Massey Dialogues. Massey College is a place for ideas. Its mission is to nourish learning and serve the public good. Massey College, the, the physical location, is located uh, in Toronto on Indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wandat, the Seneca, and the Nemesisagas of the Credit. We're very grateful for the opportunity to continue to do our work here. The idea of Massey Dialogues is that to serve the public good, we need to build bridges between uh, disciplines, but also between generations. So the innovation of the Massey Dialogues is that we hear great scholars, great researchers. Today we'll have uh, Dr. Anita McGann and Dr. Uh, James Urbinski. But we also want to hear from uh, the younger scholars, the, our, our junior fellows. And today we will be joined by Amanda Loader, who is a PhD candidate here at U of T. So I'm just going to introduce our, our guests for today. Uh, I'm going to speak to them a little bit, but you can ask questions and please do ask questions on the side of your YouTube and I will uh, put your questions to our guests as we progress through the shows. So first of all, I want to thank them, thank all three of them for joining us. It's wonderful. It's a real honor for me uh, to have the three of you here discussing such an important uh, topic today about the future of global health. First, let me introduce uh, Dr. McGann. She's a university professor at the University of Toronto, a professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, a professor of strategic management at the Rotman School of Management, and she holds the George E. Connell Chair in Organization and Society. Her research has always focused on industry change, sustainable competitive advantage, and the establishment of new field. And she has been really a great advocate and great interest in the area of global health. She is a senior uh, resident senior fellow at Massey College, a wonderful member of our community, and I'm just very grateful that she's here today. Thank you for being here. Amanda Loader is a third year resident a PhD candidate at, in physical geography and environmental studies. Her research focuses on quantifying carbon stores in wetland soils. And she's passionate about the environment, passionate about the way in which we have to understand and apply science to uh, continue to have good environmental sustainability and good environmental management. And she is a great member of the Massey community as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Uh, James Orbinski needs no introduction. He's a Canadian physician, humanitarian activist, author, leading scholar in global health. Uh, he has uh, worked with many universities. He is now uh, the inaugural, inaugural director of the Dadali uh, Institute of Global Health at York University, but continues his work obviously with the, uh, all of the University of Toronto group as well. And he's well known for his uh, great work at Médecins Sans Frontières. He was a practitioner during several international crises in Somalia, Zaire, and particularly in Rwanda. It's a great honor to have you here. Welcome. So well, let's start with uh, uh, Dr. McGann. You know, maybe you could situate us a little bit and uh, you're, you're one that says that despite everybody saying, well, on one hand, uh, we have to, we have the economy, and on the other hand, we have to stop this, this, uh, uh, this pandemic, so we're, it's a trade-off. We have to uh, uh, look at it as opposite ends, and you're saying, no, no, that's the wrong way of conceptualizing the problem. Can you tell me a little bit more of what you're suggesting? Thank you, Natalie, and uh, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that generous introduction. And I just want to say hello to the Massey community and to our colleagues everywhere in the world and uh, send good wishes for, for health and safety as we go through uh, what is uh, clearly an incredibly challenging uh, a time. Special shout out to people who uh, are graduating this year. And I also wanted to uh, express uh, sympathy and support for anyone who's lost a loved one to this terrible disease uh, during the tragedy. So, uh, Natalie, to get straight to your question, you know, we have to, we know that 
health depends on uh, both uh, uh, great medical care and on economic activity. We know that one of the leading indicators of ill health is impoverishment. And we already have been told by uh, you know, way too many experts, I'm, I'm afraid that we're going into a very deep global recession and one that is potentially commensurate with the Great Depression of the 1930s. And so the question is, how do we avert that? How do we manage that? And the way I'm thinking about this is a very inspired by the kinds of conversations we have at Massey. We have to have, you know, all hands on deck to, to do what we can to uh, address the pandemic. The first thing we have to do economically, of course, is to get to a sustainable, a more sustainable way of delivering medical care and health care. And that means we need to reopen uh, and relieve the workers in healthcare who have been flat out for the last uh, six weeks, eight weeks. We have to find ways to get these new medicines developed and new, the equipment and the PPE uh, developed that people need. And then we have to start to think about other areas of economic activity that can support uh, the, the health system. But the fundamental framing here is we have to figure out how to unleash the, the creative capacity of the private sector in support of the kinds of transformations we need to you know, manage uh, the infectiousness of COVID and, and, and the response to it. But isn't it, uh, last week we had on uh, Massey Dialogue, you know, the idea of getting quickly uh, transforming industries so that they can manufacture the things we need. Right. Uh, but I think you're talking as well from a larger, um, a more systemic way in which this is an opportunity for many industries and, and many institutions to rethink about their function and, and doing it in a way that will prevent a future uh, contagion, but also uh, adapt to the fact that physical distancing might be around for a while. Is uh, I agree. Yes, of course. So just uh, distinguishing the short run and the long run, you know, question that you're raising, Natalie, for a moment here, I see a couple of things in the short run that have already started to emerge as kind of, um, you know, contours on what we'll have to be doing over the next couple of months. One of them is, is as I as I alluded to, slowly reopening the economy. Um, probably before some parts of the economy will probably have to be opened before we have uh, a vaccine that's uh, comprehensively available. And so there we're going to need uh, individual quarantine instead of collective quarantine, rigorous testing and constant testing and contact tracing in order to make that happen. And we have to figure out how to support that through at work, really. Uh, we have to figure out how are we gonna test people at work? How are we gonna implement the kind of contact tracing that's necessary? And of course, social distancing and safe practices. The second is, I don't think we have yet uh, come into a really thoughtful conversation, uh, you know, in society about the hangover of fear and suffering and pain uh, that uh, is 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 going to result even for the eight weeks of experience that we've had so far. So there are going to be a lot of changing worker needs. You know, uh, the workforce is going to inherently um, be different in its in the way that we interact and the way that our needs as people. Uh, are presented at work. For example, if I were to go back uh, uh, to work, let's say, as a volunteer in a hospital, I might have to leave quickly if I were exposed and had to self-quarantine, or if my child were exposed and, and, and at school and I had to uh, self-quarantine in order to protect my colleagues. So how do we manage that transience in the workforce? I don't think we've really got our head around that yet. We haven't thought about the changes in consumer demand that have arisen. Um, and the way that online and offline workers will interact. So there's a lot of work to do to try to think about that. And then the third thing, even in the short run, is to start to think about innovation, including the implementation of social distancing uh, practices. Now, you and I were talking in the lead up to this conversation about Massey and how it will be different, you yeah. know, over the coming months and the coming semesters. How do we social distancing safely uh, at Massey? And th those are the kinds of questions that will arise everywhere where people are starting to return to work. But can I say one other quick thing? I don't think we can go back to work and reopen the economy very broadly anytime soon. Yeah. I've been involved in some modeling efforts and we're gonna have to do this very thoughtfully and carefully and safely uh, yeah. in order to prevent a second, a second wave. 
In the long run, we're going to need new institutions. I mean, so now we're talking here. Um, the long, long run now is yeah. six months. <laughs> the long run used to be three years. Now a long run here is six months. But new types of institutions, for example, um, I shared with you that uh, Tiff Mapham, our dean at Rotman, and I have been thinking about well, what would it mean to create, you know, a health stability board yeah. that has the same kinds of functions as the financial stability board does in in financial. Uh, in 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 the in the financial system, and I can't help also but to notice that uh, in the United States, there's been a withdrawal of support today, this morning, for the World Health Organization. What does that mean for international institutions when such a large uh, uh, country withdraws support? So, trying to think about how do we create a robust international system of institutions to protect against uh, 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 this virus and future viruses. Well, I, it's about time to bring the, if we're talking about the future viruses, the impact on the future, I think I want to bring in uh, Amanda on this uh, conversation about what, any questions that what uh, Dr. McGann just talked about, does that resonate with you? Is that something that, that even uh, speaks to your own research? Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the introduction earlier. And thanks so much, Anita, for your words earlier regarding, you know, those out there um, sending best wishes and sending sympathies for those who have lost loved ones to uh, to this awful virus. But yeah, no, what Anita said regarding, um, you know, institutional in institutions and making large changes there uh, for the long term, I think resonates with me greatly also when thinking about, you know, the climate change crisis and how these kind of crises that are that are coming up, you know, we can take our individual action, say, but we really need these collective, collective strategies to move forward on these large issues. And, you know, coming back to, to organizations like the World Health Organization, you know, there really are ways that we involve all, all countries because, you know, we're really, we're, as has been said many times, we're all in this, in this together and what one nation does is going to affect the other nations. And, you know, we can think of that in terms of the health implications like COVID-19, but we can also think of that in terms of the climate crisis too. So in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to keep global temperatures below two degrees Celsius so we can prevent the catastrophic implications that can come out of, uh, that will or potentially could come out of uh, a warming climate. And again, you know, if one, it's the kind of thing, if, if we're not all following and working together on these kind of issues, then it's going to be really hard to make, uh, to manage uh, the deadly consequences that can come out of this. So that, that brings me to uh, Dr. Abinsky. Let's hear from you. I mean, on two things that come to me is uh, the link between climate change and, and uh, COVID-19 or pandemics and the incredible humanitarian costs that that uh, that we see unfolding here throughout the world yeah uh, well uh, first of all it's it's uh, wonderful to be part of the of the uh, discussion uh, and uh, wonderful to be <coughs> engaged with the Massey community um, around uh, around these issues let me just respond a little bit to to what Anita has raised, uh, and also uh, to what uh, Amanda has has uh, uh, raised. I think just very generally, you know, we're 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 at a point where uh, we have, um, I think, converging uh, crises uh, around issues of the global commons. Um, the Anita has pointed very directly at the need for certain institutional structures and reforms, uh, both globally and, and domestically. And what I would say is, uh, just remind us that that the the, the multilateral system that we have uh, in place was created uh, after World War II, um, just after World War II, uh, and um, for some seventy or so years, uh, it has functioned uh, with a, a certain degree of imperfection. Uh, I would I would say generously, uh, but at the same time it has functioned, uh, and it has it is the first time in human history uh, that we've actually had a formalized institutional global mm -hmm. architecture uh, for uh, engaging and um, uh, debating and in uh, again imperfectly uh, resolving uh, issues of the global commons. 
I would say as well that um, you know, here following the 2008 financial crisis, uh, and uh, now uh, with this uh, uh, this uh, uh, global health crisis, um, that architecture uh, has never been needed more uh, than it is needed now, and yet it has rarely, if ever, been as sidelined uh, uh, as it is now. Uh, and I would argue that that um, the the announcement this morning uh, by uh, or yesterday by Mr. Trump uh, that he or President Trump uh, that uh, he was going to cut uh, funding to the WHO uh, it really points to the profound fragility uh, of our of our system uh, and uh, of our failing system uh, and it points to the vulnerability of that system uh, to one of the most powerful actors in the world uh, that has uh, frankly fundamentally and systematically over the last number of years uh, tried to uh, dismantle and disable uh, that multilateral uh, architecture. We're facing now with COVID um, a major uh, global health crisis. Uh, and you've asked me to, to touch on some of the humanitarian issues. Uh, well, I can certainly do that. Uh, uh, what I would say is probably the single most important issue uh, from a humanitarian perspective is that OCHA, which is the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, they have asked for $2 billion mm -hmm. uh, to fund a global COVID response. Now, they asked for that two, two and a half weeks ago. Uh, it has only been funded to the extent of 18% of that, of that two billion has been funded. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations has called for a global ceasefire uh, in order to be able to focus systematically on uh, COVID and on the most vulnerable people, which are those pe internally displaced and refugee people uh, in situations or regions of conflict. Uh, there has been no global ceasefire. Uh, in fact, uh, humanitarian assistance to, for example, Yemen, uh, has been systematically manipulated uh, uh, in the last two weeks uh, by the United States and, and by other uh, allies uh, of the United States uh, in Yemen. And so, for example, World Food Program, uh, which uh, feeds 12 million people in Yemen, 80% uh, of which are Houthi, um, their funding uh, is uh, going to be cut uh, uh, and that means that the world food program will be unable uh, to feed uh, uh, the majority of people uh, in Yemen and that's quite apart from the COVID response mm -hmm. so we have these these converging uh, circumstances uh, where the very architecture that we have in place, uh, deal with uh, uh, major issues is fundamentally failing uh, and this is a this is a, a uh, uh, this is a very very foundational uh, issue uh, that portends uh, uh, deep implications uh, for 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 our future. I, so I think we it's a pretty dark place. It's uh, very dark. <laughs> and, and and there's a, a a cry or a need to reinvention to new creation to. Uh, don't you think that a crisis like this may, like the Second World War, uh, uh, you know, kind of stimulate the the right type of thinking, you know, to uh, to actually re-energize uh, a slightly different uh, uh, international response that could come out of the sobering uh, experience that we're just uh, living through, and. It could very well be that the United States will be isolated in this, but uh, that may uh, allow for new models or a model uh, to emerge. It, am I being too optimistic or, or, uh, about the, the possibility that indeed um, you have to sometimes go to the very depth to be able to emerge and, and, and be forced to uh, reinvent something that was not working? I, I'd like to have uh, everyone comment on this. Uh, let's start with Anita. We haven't heard from you. so. Well, thank you. Um, James, great to see you. Amanda, thank you. Um, there's so much to say about this that one uh, overpowering 
feeling that I have, Natalie, is I wonder whether or not there might be an interest at NASI and maybe we can work on this to have a working group mm -hmm. to start to think about this because addressing these kinds of challenges is going to require the kind of multidisciplinary uh, invention that uh, James just described and that is characteristic of the Massey community, I think really quite uniquely. So if, if there's interest in that, I would be thrilled to be a part of that and start to think about that, have a working group um, here. Just to touch on some layers of this, you know, uh, James and I have been thinking, and, and, and Amanda focused on this centrally, about the global architecture here. And James James and I, I have to say, have been friends for years. We're part of a group of friends that was supposed to give a panel tonight in person at Massey, including Alex Haddad and Sophie uh, Ikura. And uh, it's just uh, so hard to not be with them here now. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were going to be talking about how in a, the level of a city such as Toronto, you could build resilience to these converging challenges that James has described. International institutions also need to be uh, invested in, enlivened, and given the kind of authority and agency to, to be able to be compelling. Now, there's a lot to say about that. I I don't know if I disagree with you, James, uh, maybe that's a little bit too strong, but I see another opportunity in the global architecture, which is to start to create multiple multilateral institutions that would have uh, that would have to interact and that each could represent points of view where there could be, you know, the, the World Health Organization, in my view, has been radically underfunded, a $4.2 billion budget, I believe, last year. You know, there has to be, I think, a system of international agencies. And the reason for that is you need um, the views of large constituents, such as uh, the population of the United States that uh, is represented by President Trump and that view to have a, to, ha to be able to articulate in a global conversation what the underlying need is so that you can get past the politici politicization of the issues and into the underlying concerns that are that are reasonable and that are that are tractable and try to develop solutions and our institutions have to be so what, let's bring in uh, uh, Amanda while we fix uh, uh, poor Anita's uh, technical issues. It was not done. I hope it's not uh, Trump that is trying to silence her there, you know. So uh, Amanda, any any thoughts on, I mean, the, it's pretty dire to think that, you know, this investment in multilateralism is uh, being deflected, undermined for many years now but not having, and we're always struggling with, you know, is it because we don't have enough imagination or is it just the lack of political will? Do we just sit and, and watch it disintegrate? What, you're, what do you young people think about this? Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I think some of these issues we've really, you know, we've seen, we've seen coming for some time now, but I think now, you know, now that we see kind of like was already mentioned, these conversion crises and seeing these all come together at once, I think, at least for me, this is what really paints a dark picture going forward is that, you know, not only, for example, right now, are we dealing with this pandemic? And as was outlined about, you know, cuts, in money for food, uh, especially for countries that already face uh, food insecurity. And for example, adding on the climate crisis where some regions are going to become even more food insecure, especially with extreme weather events, you know, like droughts um, and wildfires. I think for me, that is what really paints the dark picture is that is, you know, maybe we've looked at these crises a bit in silo, but now looking at them together, and especially where we're in a time where we are starting to see these kind the implications of, for example, the climate crisis. Um, now we're seeing them come together and seeing, you know, the problems that are going to arise uh, in the future and that younger generations are really going to bear the brunt of these issues coming together. But I think as Anita also mentioned too right now, and you mentioned the quote, which I really liked, uh, Winston Churchill being saying, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, I also have hope though, and I see that in younger generations too, having hope and being able to use these kind of times to think about what do we want in our future? What is, what is the earth we all want 
to live on together and how do we want it want it to look and I know many of us, uh, you know, we we have, uh, you know, we've had these kind of discussions, and we know these ideas, and the some of these approaches are here that we can begin to take, so we can mitigate some of these awful implications that could uh, could come about if we stay business as usual. Uh, maybe I'll let Anita continue now that oh, I'm so her. sorry. Yeah. I apologize, uh, Amanda. Thank you for stepping in. I apologize for for, for that technical glitch. What I was going to say is that on the other side of the coin uh, for the need for these amazing global institutions, I I think we are seeing a lot, an incredible amount of humanitarian sentiment and energy and activity and outpouring from our medical workers, from our first line workers and so on. So the, 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 the need to get to work is enormous. The, the, the requirements are enormous, but so is the energy for, uh, innovating and improving. And I, uh, I'm hopeful, if not even optimistic, that that can, that that can happen. So James, this is your, this yeah. is your, your day job. <laughs> so, but uh, Dr. Urbinski, I'm, uh, two things. Number one, what would you like to see, you know, within the next six months uh, in terms of uh, a change of course or new ideas or, or uh, pressures uh, so that we would begin to uh, address some of the failures you, you, you've identified. Uh, and secondly, is there a change moving from institutions to a uh, groundswell movement or, uh, you know, from the, the young people demonstrating and for climate change to is, is this new, uh, once we've got a hold of how we demonstrate uh, with the physical distancing, I, I know in Israel there they had a, a car uh, protest, which is not that great for climate change, but they were trying to express their uh, their feelings this way. Are there ways in which you could see the civil society uh, raising to the challenge and wanting and asking for for better responses? Yeah, so I would let me just respond a little bit to some of the the comments. Um, I think multilateral institutions are absolutely vital. Uh, there is no question. Uh, that uh, the future uh, requires viable, strong, uh, focused, and competent multilateral institutions. You know, we're 7.7 billion people on the planet. Uh, we're adding a billion people to the planet every 13 years. We have major ecological degradation. We have, uh, as a consequence of, of the ways in which human civilizations function, Um, we have major challenges of the global commons, and we've just touched on a couple of them now, uh, climate change, pandemic disease, uh, financial stability, global financial stability, uh, and so on. There are, there are many. Um, so there's no question that in terms of a viable future, we need good global governance. Uh, and pro that is probably the single area where we have the greatest challenge right now. All of these other issues Um, uh, cannot be dealt with effectively unless we have an effective governance system. So I just want to be absolutely clear about that, in my, at least from my perspective. I would also say that today, especially given uh, the Trump administration's cut uh, or announced cut to the WHO, uh, this, is, this is not a short-term, uh, a six-month sort of horizon issue. This is a today issue. Uh, and the WHO Uh, needs not only financial uh, stability, but it needs political support and stability. Uh, I am absolutely not going to say that WHO is, is a perfect institution. It is not. Uh, but, and I'm not going to say that it has managed uh, this, ep this pandemic perfectly. Um, certainly, the, there are some, some important questions that need to be asked uh, uh, about uh, what has happened, and we need to engage in a lessons learned process. No question about that. But at the same time, I think there is also, more importantly, no question that that institution is fundamental to dealing effectively uh, with this pandemic, not in six months, but today. And so, so can that, I, uh, yeah, pardon me. So, so can I just respond? I agree entirely. I think what I was talking about was a s six months to set up some new institutions yeah. that could... Uh, that could interact with and support uh, the World Health Organization. There's no question in my mind that the World Health Organization needs to be supported uh, yesterday and today and tomorrow. 
um, and, and, and for every day uh, thereafter. So that's what I meant by the six months, is new kinds of institutions that, uh, that could, uh, it, like for example, let me just give you a flavor of what I'm thinking about. Uh, uh, so Tiff and I, um, in our in our thinking, are, are are talking about a health stability board that would maintain uh, inventories on private sector capabilities for producing medical equipment around the world that would facilitate coordination. The um, uh, governor of uh, the great state, the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, just last week, had to work with the Kraft family to get the Patriots plane to fly uh, through Alaska, where the governor of Alaska worked with uh, Chinese officials, especially the consul general, uh, Chinese consul general in New York, to get special uh, permits to be able to land the Patriots plane in Hubei to bring back N95 masks to Boston, some of which were then sent by truck to New York, where uh, the pandemic in the United States is most virulent. It is in my opinion, nuts for governors of states to have to coordinate through private sector, you know, activity like that. First, you know, Tencent had to be engaged to do the logistics on the ground and Hubei. So yes, the World Health Organization is absolutely vital, but we also need other institutions that can yeah. monitor and deepen and, 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 and advise in advance of emergencies on building the kind of resilience we need in the health system. So, so this disease, as Amanda said, is a global disease. So we need global institutions to manage the global yeah. risk. Okay, we but, have to have, but healthcare delivery is a local, is a local yes, activity. Right. And then in between those levels, including those two levels, global and very local, but also intermediate levels. We have health uh, supply chains, manufacturing supply chains that have not operated effectively, in my opinion, in this pandemic. So we need institutions at these different levels that can interact to manage risk, to help coordinate, to try to um, make more effective the deployment of the kind of private sector capability that that example of N95 masks landing on the Boston tarmac and the Patriots jet represents. That is not something that the governor of Massachusetts, in my view, should have had to organize. We should have a global institution available to do that. But the fact that he had to will precipitate uh, a rethinking of the way in which we manage uh, uh, long-term planning for the integration of uh, of uh, health infrastructure. So, so sometimes you know that's it. It requires that particular crisis to recognize the big gaps and the holes. I want to go back to the WHO, the uh, Dr. Urbinski. Wh why is it that we have so much trouble trusting international organizations? and giving them our full support. Is it because we cannot criticize them enough or we are framed in our criticism by our state, you know, only this as opposed to having, you know, uh, like all other institutions where you can, you know, have uh, debates about whether things are going well and uh, not so well and so on. Is is there a problem of, of uh, democratic engagement uh, in international multilateral uh, institutions that make them so remote and therefore so vulnerable? Well, I think the, the short answer, at least from my perspective, uh, is that um, multilateral institutions uh, function to pursue the common good uh, in, perp in, in principle. Um, the challenge is that it is self interested actors, the self-interests of nation states uh, that um, uh, essentially governs uh, the activity of a particular multilateral institution. And the more powerful a particular nation state is uh, in relative terms, the more influence it has and the more control it has on the functionality of a particular multilateral institution in its ability to pursue the common interest. Now, that's a that's a political dilemma, uh, and um, the fact is that you know the the uh, the circumstance now around funding of the WHO being cut by the United States is a perfect example of that. You know, Mr. Trump is using the WHO as a diversion for his own profound, egregious failure uh, to deal with 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 an epidemic uh, within his own country, 
um, he's creating, he set up a, a straw dog, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and, and that's what, that's what this is. Now the consequence of that is, is potentially profound for the entire world. Now, what I would say is that, as, as I was saying earlier, what the WHO needs right now today uh, is political support uh, and it needs guaranteed uh, funding. Uh, so uh, nations around the world, including Canada, should be stepping up very obviously and saying, look, we support the WHO, number one, done deal. And whatever short-term funding needs it, it, it has uh, over the coming year, pending the American review, we will backstop that. Okay. That's the first thing I think that okay. should happen. The okay. second is that the kind of issue that Anita is talking about, I profoundly agree with her. Uh, and I very much think that the, the core concept that she's advanced uh, over the last 30 minutes or so around a health stability board, I think this is a really powerful idea. Uh, and it's the kind of, of, of concept uh, that, uh, that can really lead to genuine innovation. Uh, in global governance. Uh, so I would really encourage uh, Anita to pursue that uh, and to work with uh, uh, whoever you wish to work with, and I hope that would include me, <laughs> to think that through. Uh, because I think it's a profoundly important idea, and it has deep implications, not simply for those uh, nation states or those communities that are part of an existing supply chain, uh, but for those nation states and communities that aren't. Right, and this this growing divide between the north and the south, uh, this is this is a a divide that has to be addressed because it is you know to put it in the most sort of uh, uh, philosophical terms, it's wise self interest for uh, one nation to be concerned about the health and welfare of uh, people in other nations, if not only for better management of pandemic risk. Right, so. That, that that requires a new approach, a new uh, a new thinking, not just about supply chain, but about health and about systems and, and uh, uh, healthcare personnel and so on and so on. So, Amanda, do you think that young people could get behind the WHO or is it uh, too far or too, uh, uh, too traditional in organizations? Like, why isn't it that, uh, you know, we start a petition, you, you know, with uh, among the junior fellows say, Hey, I need the WHO and I want it for my future, you know. Yeah, I mean, that is a very, a very good <laughs> point right there. And I think what's been mentioned, too, in terms of just caring and empathy is so important in all of this. You know, just thinking about the common good and not just, you know, individual, individual motivation. That's cool. I think it's something younger people are willing and interested to get behind. And as also was mentioned, maybe the WHO is not perfect, but I think it really represents, you know, global leadership on this kind of issue and is a platform where, you know, we need to be able to work together to address this. But yeah, I think that absolutely, you know, countries need to, we need to be able to step up to be able to compensate or at least try to compensate for big players that are pulling out of supporting the, the WHO. And I think too, what, you know, all this also really represents as well in terms of health. And I think has demonstrated that, you know, your health in a way is your wealth. It's really, it's, you know, it, and I think during this time where we're social distancing, it also, sh you know, I think, or I hope forces people to really think about what are our true values in life. Is it consumerism? Is it, you know, car high carbon footprints? Does that really equate to happiness overall? And I think it's a call for people to think more about empathy. And their own value. I mean, it's, and we all are spending a lot of time trying to assess and have been to change. We will all have to change. We know that it's not going to to be the same uh, the same way. Uh, I was uh, uh, wondering about the the quote from Maud Barlow, who says, "You know, who's going to change? Well, if you want to know who's going to change, go home and look in the mirror. That's uh, you know, that's how change happens. Is when people take responsibility and." And, and get it done. So we have one call for action, which is uh, getting Canada to to, uh, to step up and or and many other people to step up to uh, 
express their support to WHO. We have some support for the idea of exploring new institutions that would be in the business of managing better the shortfalls of, of our uh, health planning across boundaries, uh, across... Uh, and uh, now, are you worried that, uh, the, Amanda, that this crisis has not, has kind of not put the environment at the at the forefront, you know, that we haven't really linked it to uh, environmental concerns and that, are you worried that we, you know, the first thing that disappeared was uh, uh, going in uh, uh, the, the bins are disappeared. Now we have all these uh, rubber gloves lying everywhere, more plastic being used and so on. Or on the other hand, people said, well, we're slowing down the economy. It's probably good for uh, green gas. Have you, isn't there, the, is the environmental movement in silo, too siloed and has not engaged fully with, with healthcare promotion or am I too severe here? Yeah, no, those are a lot of really interesting questions raised. I think right now people that work in the fields of environmental sciences or even envir just environmental activism in general are really trying to put out there that you know, how we treat our planet and mother nature will affect, will ultimately affect our health, whether you're talking about in terms of our interactions with wildlife or in terms of, um, in terms of the climate crisis. I think right now there's certainly, there is a push to, while we deal with this crisis to think about, well, how we deal with it now is going to have implications down the road. So for example, is going to have implications on how we and how long it takes for us to or if we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions enough to prevent the catastrophic implications that the climate climate crisis could have um i think at play though that does make it tricky is timeline so yes the climate climate change is happening right now we're already seeing the implications but the way it plays out take plays out longer whereas with covid19 right now you know it's by the hour it seems that you know things are changing things are shifting so it's hard i think for you know the general public to keep the climate crisis at the front or uh, forefront when you know we're being bombarded with things by the covid 19. but i think it's important that we don't forget that how we deal with the covid 19 is certainly will affect how we deal with climate change so I think it, there's a uh, anita perfect. wanted to get in here yeah so amanda i I wanted to I, I wanted to respond with the observation that I think that both climate change and COVID-19 and other problems in our society, James has already mentioned uh, immigration and refugee uh, uh, tragedies and, 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 and condition and so on, the condition of indigenous people are all symptomatic of uh, 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 of the same problem, which is ineffective global governance lack of depth and resilience resilience and good process for uh, the management of international institutions and a link between global risk management and local delivery of essential services, uh, both related to climate and related to COVID, as well as uh, inequality generally and, and uh, immigration refugees and so on. So I see uh, climate, the climate problem and the, 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 the management of this pandemic as symptomatic of the same fundamental problem, which is, you know, again, coming back to the WHO, we can't expect a single institution that has to be organized in order to be effective in silos. It has to have specialization to have the kind of depth and resilience to respond unilaterally uh, to, to a multinational crisis like this. We have to have interleaved institutions that can work together that would prevent, for example, um, a large country such as the United States from withdrawing uh, funding unilaterally because of a decision that hasn't been pro put through a process. There's no other institutions that can step in and lend support and lend credibility and, you know, and, and, and drive the kind of conversation that we seek to drive about getting Canada and other countries to step in the breach. All of that absence of governance is causing both the climate problem and the pandemic problem at the same time. 
as well as other problems such as James has mentioned. Well, one of the issues that, you know, if you re read the, the Globe this morning, they're saying, well, the tendency has been in the context of dealing with pandemics, one tendency is to say, okay, let's, let's close the border. You know, and we saw that a little bit in Canada, you know, just, oh, well, our refugees, we're going to not uh, allow them uh, because who knows what they're carrying. So there's a tendency, so you're, one of the tension will become if people embrace that idea that, and you know, that is exemplified by President Trump's uh, decision, which is, I deal with my own problem, I kick strangers away, and that's how uh, I will survive. You know, the kind of the, that's completely antagonistic to uh, to what we've been talking about, which is enhance uh, global governance, enhance uh, interdependency management of the interdependency in a more uh, resourced uh, and and thoughtful way. Am I am I uh, identifying a problem in the way in which this pandemic has raised and amplified some voices of? Uh, shutting down the borders, closing off, and so on. And is that going to be a problem going forward? Uh, Dr. Urbinski, let's start with you. Um, well, I just want to make one quick point about uh, climate change, uh, just a very practical uh, reality. Uh, there's a thing with COVID called the temperature effect, uh, and we don't know yet uh, whether or not we will see seasonal variation in the in the prevalent incidence and prevalence of COVID as a function of temperature, uh, so we know that, for example, flu uh, uh, changes is seasonal, and that's very much a function of of temperature. We don't know if that's going to be true for COVID, and temperature increase is one of the major major uh, drive uh, outcomes. Uh, of uh, uh, increased greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so just to, to, to put a very concrete link between climate change impacts uh, and uh, pandemic uh, impacts, there, there is one. Uh, mm -hmm. There are others uh, in terms of hunger uh, and the effect of climate change on food security and the effect of, of COVID on food uh, security. So you have these multiple converging mm -hmm. and then compounding uh, impacts on uh, individual and population health. So I just want to sort of put that in the uh, onto the onto the the table. It's it, governance is extremely important, but but it's important because of these very clear causal relationships uh, that cause compounding uh, uh, impacts. On the question of, of th that you're raising around border controls. Uh, and um, social distancing. You know, I think the, the big challenge with border controls and, and, and pandemic disease uh, is that they give, they can give a false sense of security. That's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest real, uh, the biggest challenge. Uh, and they can also draw on xenophobic uh, tendencies uh, and nationalistic tendencies uh, as a way of, um, uh, uh, as a way of justifying. Uh, um, or using a pandemic uh, risk to justify, in fact, subconscious or sub uh, subsurface uh, xenophobia. So the one can feed the other. Uh, but this, whether that's right or wrong, and clearly I think that's quite wrong, um, uh, it, it can create and often uh, almost inevitably does create a false sense of security. Now, at the same time, it's, I think it's quite important to recognize that border controls are not they should not be dismissed simply because they are associated often with xenophobia and nationalism in, in the way that I've described. There are circumstances where border controls are actually extremely important and extremely effective uh, in terms of reducing the risk uh, of, uh, uh, of, of exposure. However, that said, border controls in the absence of rigorous domestic public health interventions to reduce uh, uh, community transmission, for example, uh, rigorous domestic public health uh, interventions to identify, for example, a COVID positive person, uh, to test that person, to contact trace, to isolate uh, people within a domestic community uh, so that you reduce risk. These things in parallel can have a profound positive impact. Uh, on uh, uh, containment and control of, a, of an infectious disease risk. And we've seen that around the world. 
So this is actually a very good example of, of where we really need to be quite rigorous in our intellectual analysis of, of um, the effect of one intervention versus another uh, and our analysis of, of one intervention in concert with another and their impacts. Now, the other really important issue here is the communication of these interventions. If one communicates in a manner that actually feeds xenophobia, feeds uh, racism, and feeds a na a nationalistic uh, sentiment, this is very dangerous. Not simply uh, uh, because that in itself, in my view, is, is a wrong, uh, but because this in fact accelerates risk uh, of a particular uh, pandemic. So let's go to uh, uh, maybe uh, Amanda, any comments on this? And I'm I'm inviting questions from the audience. I know they're coming in on uh, on my phone here. So Amanda, what's, uh, and any comments on, on, on this? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think coming back to considering the different implications of kinds of, you know, different kinds of interventions, something Anita and I have been talking about a lot in terms of the UN sustainability, sustainable development goals is trade-offs, you know, when we put in certain measures, are there trade-offs because of this, you know, and this is in themes not just health-wise or environmental-wise, but also in terms of socioeconomics and, and finances, finances too. So I think, you know, really being able to have, uh, you know, wide views of why we do, why we are putting in certain kinds of measures is what's going to help us in the long term to envision, you know, consequences might come out of it or, you know, the benefits that'll come out of it. Because, you know, there might be benefits, you know, when we do one thing, we see we see another thing. Um, and even in terms of what we you were saying earlier, Natalie, with COVID-19 measures, you know, an example, we see the, shut, you know, sh things shutting down, but we see a decline in greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, now that's certainly, you know, if we continue business as per usual, when things get back to, I don't want to say normal, because who knows what a new normal will be like, but, you know, if say the economy gets up and running again, um, you know, those green, if we don't, if we stay to, if we go back to our old ways, then, you know, we'll see those emissions rise again. So I think, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, or as was mentioned before, looking at the different um, the different dimensions, whether it's of measures, is is really important. And I have a feeling Anita might want to jump in here as I brought up the UN Sustainable uh, Development of Development Goals because I know this is something we've been wanting to bring into Massey more, where we have such a wide array of people working in different different disciplines so it really enables discussion on um yeah on these on these goals and the different kinds of uh the different kinds of dimensions that are fed in so before i go to anita to respond to this uh, her favorite subject sustainable goals i just want to put out a a question that came from the audience here uh which speaks to the governance of the federal governance it says is it time for nations like Canada or the U.S. Uh, to centralize healthcare under federal jurisdiction in order to be able to deal more effectively with pandemics? It seems that the provinces and the states are barriers at times. What do you think? Uh, I think we need uh, federal institutions in healthcare to track capacity and so on. I, but I don't think that those federal institutions are a substitute for the provincial institutions. I think they're a complement to them. That will amplify the effectiveness of our provincial institutions, state and local institutions, not substitute for them. And they can serve as a, another kind of a layer of uh, good governance uh, between the provinces and uh, the WHO and other multilateral agencies across countries. We are moving into a new global order, a new system. Uh, we've had 75 years, as James mentioned, of post-World War II framework for uh, governance. The SDGs, Amanda, I think, provide us with a kind of roadmap. Now everything is, uh, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to each element of, you know, what's going on around us. But the SDGs can serve as a kind of North Star toward that new system. And, you know, you, Natalie, earlier you quoted Churchill on no good crisis goes wasted. You know, we need uh, 
to urgently respond uh, to what's happened and to and to think through, you know, what from the old World War II framework do we have to set aside? The innovation agenda actually has not changed from mid-February to mid-April. <laughs> you know, it, what's changing is the the capacity to execute on the innovation agenda. And what we need now to do is to embody the values of Amanda's and most of Massey College's junior fellowships agenda, uh, which is, you know, sharing more, less frivolous consumption, more thoughtful uh, action for the environment, more e equity and humanity uh, toward people who are not as privileged as we are sitting behind our glass screens protected from COVID while many uh, disenfranchised people and uh, unemployed people are suffering, many um, low-income people are out there exposing themselves every day uh, to try to earn uh, a living through the crisis. So how do we, how do we enact the, those values in a whole new framework for how we live? That really is is the opportunity here, and the SDGs give us a kind of beacon for you know how to do that or how to think about getting started. <laughs> and uh, in a way, how to measure our uh, our, our progress as well. So, yes, uh, Dr. Urbinski, uh, any thoughts on uh, federalism here or or on the SDG goal? Um, well, I, I would just you know just say that that uh, this pandemic. Um, has different patterns in different parts of the world, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, in Africa, where only 2% of global commercial uh, air travel and traffic uh, occurs, we've actually seen a slower onset uh, of the pandemic. Um, and a, um, so we're now starting to see massive increases in the number of people who are COVID positive. But that's that's delayed relative to Europe, relative to Asia, Europe, and the United States. So, because there are differences, because there are regional differences, um, that it implies that a one-size-fits-all form of governance and intervention uh, would not necessarily make sense. That also applies in Canada. It also applies in the United States. So there's an East Coast, West Coast, uh, um, um, Central United States, and Southern United States variants in the in the in the pattern of the epidemic. The same is true in Canada. There's different patterns in different cities uh, and in uh, Central Canada versus Eastern Canada, for example. So the flexibility of local governance is actually incredibly important. Uh, in terms of appropriate uh, containment and control uh, measures. Now that said, some form of centralized understanding and some form of centralized uh, direction uh, that is not necessarily singular, but that is coherent. I think this is the yes. this is the challenge. So I would you know the, to use the, the the old phrase local. A, glo a global and local. This is really a very good example of that. And I would, I, without going into all the sort of great details, I, I just would say that I very much agree uh, that uh, the SDGs are uh, a very viable and 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 meaningful north star, and that 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 is the direction uh, that is measurable, it's discernible, it's intelligible. Uh, maybe it could be better communicated. There could be a you know a better communication strategy, uh, but. In terms of the glowing light, you know, of, of 17 points and 17 goals, well, you know, uh, there we go. I, I think it is a good start. So we have uh, only uh, two minutes left. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, go to Amanda. A couple of uh, things you want to share as we uh, as we end this program. What did you? What are you getting out of this? I mean, lots of really good points have been brought up here. So I hope we can all go home and take a moment to digest it and think about concrete steps of where we need to go, need to go next. And I think the big theme that comes out of this is, yeah, not working in silos and really considering all, all dimensions of the issue. And something Anita brought up, which I'm glad, you know, you brought up, because I don't think, I don't know if it was touched upon or emphasized enough, is, you know, equity and all of this too, and considering, 
you know, that, you know, like Anita was saying, many of us are privileged and we're able to do our work from here, but there are people out there that are more vulnerable or those who aren't as privileged and have to put themselves out there day to day to bring in, to bring home money and increase and be at risk for this COVID-19. So I think it really comes, really comes back to, you know, how can we move forward and can, consider all of these dimensions for a better, a better planet and a better uh, future for the upcoming generations. Well, I want to thank you for, for enlightening us today. And I think we, we got at least uh, on the record some immediate action that we should ask our government to do. We also got, I think, some, uh, uh, some goalposts about uh, wanting to uh, really get on engines in terms of thinking and new institutions. So. A call to creativity and to imagination is is good. And I just want to say thank you very much for being part of the Massey Dialogue. You should know that we're going to have another uh, session on the gig economy and the exposure that COVID has put on, on these workers. So stay tuned and come back uh, to Massey Dialogues another time. Merci. Thank you.